Pastor Bobby asked me if I would um, share today, and he asked to sh for me to share on Pentecost Sunday. Now, those of you that are tracking it on their calendar, official Pentecost Sunday is next Sunday, but we're going to have an exciting youth service that we hope you all will be a part next Sunday. Um, so he asked me to prep us in preparation for Pentecost Sunday. So uh, this morning, I want, I want to talk to us about next level living, because that's really what Pentecost Sunday represents. If, if you've ever thought about it, the, the followers of Jesus, the ones that walked with him, the ones that witnessed the miracles, the ones that saw firsthand and were with him for three years, those are not the individuals that changed the world. The individuals that changed the world were their Pentecost counterparts. It's when they received baptism of the Holy Spirit that they received the power to make a difference in the world. It was Holy Spirit that took these men that were doubters and deniers and turn them into individuals that would turn the world literally upside down and change and make a difference. They became the people that would boldly proclaim the gospel and the good news of Jesus Christ, and they would fulfill the plans and purposes of God for their life. And it was Holy Spirit that empowered them to do this. In fact, this is exactly what Jesus told them would happen when he spoke his final words to them before he ascended into heaven. He said in Acts chapter 1 and verse 8, But you will receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you, and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and in all Judea and Samaria and to the ends of the earth. Jesus said, You will receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you. Father, we just come before you this morning and and we commit this service into your hands, Father God. We invite Holy Spirit to come and to speak to our hearts, Lord, and to just highlight the truths of your scriptures and your words today so that we can live a life that is at the next level, Father. We thank you for this. Amen. It's been said that the Bible was not inspired, it was not written or preserved all of these years to simply inform us. God preserved the Bible. God inspired the Bible. We have the Bible today because the Bible is meant to transform us. And it's the power of the Holy Spirit that brings the ability for the Word of God to be a transformative power in the world today. Holy Spirit has the power to transport us from the window of why through the doorway of miraculous living. How often have we stood outside and we've looked at what God has done in other places? And, and we've seen God doing this, and we've, we've seen God doing that. We've seen God use this other person. We've seen God heal somebody in the middle of the worship service, and we say, God, why not me? Because we're standing at the window of why. But when we believe in the fullness of the power of the Holy Spirit, he transports us from that window of why and leads us through the door of miraculous living. And that's what the day of Pentecost is all about, the power to make a difference, the power to make a change. That, my friends, is the type of living that transforms and turns the world upside down. And that is, what, that is, in my mind, the best definition that we could ever have for next level living. We saw the disciples and the 120 men and women that were gathered in the upper room, we saw them move to another level. That level was not just for them. And I want us to understand today, Holy Spirit is waiting and looking for people that are ready to move to the next level. Now, if you're like me, and you have a question, and, and you want answers, you go to Dr. Google, all right? Google holds a doctorate in just about everything, right? Just ask him, he'll tell you. So if you start, if you Googled define Holy Spirit or what is the Holy Spirit or how does the Holy Spirit work today, you would soon find that there's lots of different ideas. And, and I don't want us to, to spend the time looking at that. I want to offer you a simple illustration and let you make a choice. How much of the Holy Spirit do you want in your life? So we have three types of people and they all respond differently to the Holy Spirit. The first one is what we will call someone who has proportional filling of the Holy Spirit. Proportional filling. On the day they were saved, the Holy Spirit came on them and filled them part way. So we have this water bottle that has some water in it. 
All right? and, and this type of person is, they're closed. There's a lid on it. They're like, I have everything I need. God's given me the power to live, live a successful life. I have what I need. I'm Popeye the Sailor Man. It's all I need. So that's, that's the first individual. And, you know, yes, Holy Spirit is living within them. Yes, there's some guidance. Yes, there's some direction of the Holy Spirit. But they haven't received the fullness of the Holy Spirit at work in their life. The second individual is much like the first one. When they were saved, there, there was some... Um, there was some filling that came into the Holy Spirit, and this person recognizes they need Holy Spirit in their life. So they come to church service, and, and they want to receive Holy Spirit, and they want, they're want they open for Holy Spirit to come if Holy Spirit chooses to pour out in their life. So that is somebody who has potential fulfilling. Lord, if you want to use me, Holy Spirit, if you want to fill me, hunt me down and fill me. And then the third person is what we'll call someone who has purposed in their heart to be filled, right? This individual, not only have they taken the lid off, but they've surrendered their will, wants, and desires to God, and they expect God to fill them. So when we see a picture of someone that's surrendered, what do we think? You know, hands up. So this person, they have their hands up. They're waiting for Holy Spirit to come. Not only are they waiting, they're expecting Holy Spirit to come. In fact, they don't wait for the church service. They come already with Holy Spirit at work, living and acting in their life because they expect it. They position themselves. They do everything possible for it to happen. What's the sign of someone who has surrendered to God? They've said, Lord, it doesn't matter what I want. It really doesn't even matter what I desire. I want to do your will. And, and we see Jesus Christ as the best example of this on his final days here on earth when he's praying in the Garden of Gethsemane, and he says, Father, I don't want to die on the cross. If you have a plan B that you haven't told me about, now's a good time. Let's, let's put it into action. I'll, I'll go with whatever you say, God. But instead, he says, not my will, but your will be done. He sacrificed his wishes so that you and I could have eternal life. He sacrificed his desire so that we could be filled with Holy Spirit, so we could have power from on high to make a difference in the world. That's a surrendered person. Lord, not my will. And every time we surrender, what we're doing is we're putting ourselves aside so somebody else can receive from God. Sometimes we need to think about it like that. I sacrifice so somebody else can be in a place to receive from God. And that helps us make a difference. So we have, we have the person that's, you know, they're kind of closed. They, they have what they need from the Holy Spirit. They have a portion. We have the person who's open, but, you know, it's kind of Holy Spirit's job to touch them. It's Holy Spirit's job to fill them. And trust me, he can. But then you have the person who's expectant and waiting and anticipating, positioning themselves, doing everything they need to do to have Holy Spirit come. Now, I wanted to bring a hose in, but Pastor Billy said no. <laughs> I think he was afraid I would spray him with it, and mm, maybe I would have. I don't know. So we're, we're, we're just going to use this. Um, so Holy Spirit pours himself out. Each of them receive from the Holy Spirit differently. The person who's closed, you know, they might get the goosebumps. They may feel good but it's not making a lasting difference in their life because they're just getting the effects of it from being around Holy Spirit. Then you have the person who's open, and you know, if they happen to line up just exactly where God wants them, then you know, they get a little bit more of him. But what happens when the person who has surrendered to God comes, Holy Spirit starts coming, and he fills, and he fills, and he fills, and it runs out all over on other people around them, and other people receive the blessing because they expect the Holy Spirit to show up with power to transform and change lives. So we have to ask ourselves today, how much of the Holy Spirit do I want in my life? Am I happy with the measure that I received when I surrendered my heart to Jesus? And am I okay with, with that amount of Holy Spirit? And, you know, I really get pumped up when I'm around people that are excited and worshiping God. Or am I open for Holy Spirit, but I'm not really willing to surrender all? 
So Holy Spirit, if you need me to have more power, Holy Spirit, if you need me to talk to somebody, Holy Spirit, if you want me to do something, hunt me down and fill me up. Or do we want to be totally surrendered to God and say, Lord, I want your power. I want my life changed, and I want lives around me transformed. I will position myself, Father, to do whatever it takes to be the transforming power that the world needs today. That's the individual that's ready to move up in next level living. And that's what we're talking about today. So you have to ask yourself, am I satisfied with the measure of Holy Spirit that is currently working in my life today? Larry, can you move this? I'm just afraid it's going to fall everywhere. <laughs> am I ready to receive all Holy Spirit has for me? If not, it's time to change our perspective of Holy Spirit seek out, position ourselves, and desire more. So why do I need Holy Spirit in my life? What does Holy Spirit bring into my life that makes a difference? And there's much more than I'm going to share today, but I have four provisions of the Holy Spirit, four things that Holy Spirit promises to do in our life. And the first thing that we need to, that we need to recognize is Holy Spirit is a promise he is the fulfillment of a gift that Jesus promised all who call on his name. John chapter 14, verses 16 through 17 says, And I will ask the Father, and he will give you another helper to be with you forever. Even the Spirit of truth, whom the world cannot receive, because it neither sees him nor knows him, you know him, for he dwells and will be in you. John chapter 16 and verse 7 says, Nevertheless, I tell you the truth. It is to your advantage that I go away. For if I do not go away, the helper will not come to you. But if I go, I will send him to you. Holy Spirit's the promise fulfillment. The great thing about the promise fulfillment is it doesn't cost us anything. When we start talking about provisions, you know, my mind goes to what's it going to cost, All right? My son was, was planning a camping trip with seven of his college buddies. All of them, you know, money's kind of tight. So they have these grandiose ideas of what they're going to do on the camping trip. And then they started making a list. And then they saw how much steak costs. And they saw what they would have to take if they wanted to do this or do that. So they became realistic, and, and they made a budget, and everyone had their responsibility of what to bring for all the meals for the time they were camping. Because usually when we think of provisions, there's a cost associated. Christ paid the cost for us. He sends Holy Spirit not only as a promise, but as a gift to us. We choose if we are going to accept the limited portion of the gift, if we're going to accept regular withdrawals of this gift, or if we're going to accept the unlimited full potential of the gift that he has for us. He made a promise to his disciples on more than one occasion that when he left, he would send Holy Spirit to lead and guide them in all truth. He also confirmed that Holy Spirit could not come until Christ completed his mission. Now, sometimes I used to wonder, well, why? Why was it that there was only a measure of Holy Spirit when Christ walked on the earth? Wouldn't it have been more productive if him and Holy Spirit came hand in hand at the same time? I personally believe we couldn't handle both of them. Christ's teaching was, was so life-changing and so in the face of what everyone believed, they had to hear it first, and then Holy Spirit would come and help it be demonstrated and walked out in life. But there was a reason. And he said, I will go, he will come, and it's a good thing he's coming because his mission is different than mine. So when I fulfill my mission, I don't need to hang around here anymore because there's another one coming, and he's going to give you everything you need to live a successful life. Holy Spirit is the promise that Christ makes available to all who call on his name. It was not only offered to the 120 that were gathered in the upper room. 
Holy Spirit is available to all believers who call on his name. He is Christ's gift to his followers and those who choose to accept him. Now, we accept him, we can limit him, or we can reject him altogether. In other words, we can receive a portion of the promise, regular withdrawals, or we can surrender and have full access to the gift Christ has made available to us. He's a promise that you can take to the bank. It's a guarantee. And he's here and he's waiting and he's available today. The second thing the Holy Spirit provides for us is he points us in the right direction. He points us in the right direction. John chapter 16 and verse 13 says, When the Spirit of truth comes, he will guide you into all truth, for he will not speak on his own authority, but whatever he hears, he will speak, and he will declare to you the things that are to come. He points us in the right direction. He helps keep us on track. Now, when I first moved to Winchester, one thing that maybe not everyone knows about me is I'm a little directionally challenged. And when I first came, I was constantly lost in Winchester. I grew up in, in Southern California. We had these beautiful mountains, and no matter where you were, you could go outside and look to the mountains and know that's north. And then you could figure everything else south if I want to go to the beach, East, if I want to go to Palm Springs, you know, you, you just knew which way and you could just, you, got, you had this visual. I came here and it's flat. Where's north? I don't know. I became very dependent on Google Maps. I mean, very dependent on Google Maps. Then, as I got around here more, I became less and less dependent. But here's an idea, and it's almost embarrassing to say. When I first started working at the church, I was asked to mail something at the post office. I didn't know where the post office was. I mean, literally, it's that way. I had no idea. I had, to, I had to ask Bobby, Bobby, where's the post office? And he's like, right down Berryville. You can't miss it. Well, yeah, I can. <laughs> <laughs> now, my wife is the total opposite. She directions, she's been somewhere once, she knows it like the back of her hand. And she was the yard seller, so she would go out and she would yard sell, and yard selling was her GPS, so right? She would follow the signs and she, oh, I know where that is. Yeah, I went to a yard sale there. You would, you would talk about a place. Oh, yeah, there was a yard sale down the street from there. And, and she, she knew her way around. As I got more familiar, Google Maps was not needed as much as long as I had the general area uh, come down. And Holy Spirit is God's original GPS provider. When we find ourselves in a, in a situation, when we find ourselves in a place that we don't know, Holy Spirit promises to lead us, guide us, and direct us. In fact, we're encouraged to rely on Holy Spirit, especially when we find ourselves in new situations. In fact, D.L. Moody believed that the Holy Spirit plays a vital role in our ability to understand and apply Scripture in our everyday life. That's why D.L. Moody said, the Bible without Holy Spirit is as useful as a sundial by moonlight. So the Holy Spirit, he can lead and guide us in a lot of ways. Sometimes they're small ways. Sometimes they're more life-changing ways. But either way, it's still part of his responsibility. Quick example, um, about a week and a half ago, the church had an opportunity to help a family that was connected to the church but not part of the church. And we knew we wanted to help them, but we weren't sure how much. So I was asked to find out what's the need? How big is the need? So we talked to them and we found out the need is much larger than we imagined it could be. So Pastor Bobby says, well, Billy, Chris, what do you think we should do? And it was silence for, I don't know, a few seconds. And, and pastor says, well, I was thinking $500. And as soon as he did that, Holy Spirit confirmed to me, because that was the exact amount that I thought of when I first heard the need. Billy agreed when he first heard the need, $500. We're like, well, thank you, Lord, for confirming that. Now we're confident and we know that's what you want us to do. Even though the need was greater than we anticipated, you're, you're leading and guiding us to do this part and you will provide the rest. See, so that type of confirmation, it may seem small, but it helps you to know you're doing what God wants you to do. Other times, the leading and guiding can be much more life-altering. 
Uh, when Holly and I were first engaged, uh, we'd only been engaged a couple weeks, pastor of our church came to me and said, Chris, we have some, some issues in Kenya, and we don't have a missionary there right now. Can you take a trip um, and just kind of make sure things happen the way we want them to happen? Um, and while you're there, you can go check out the new property in Tanzania we just bought. But I'm warning you, it's not nice. But, you know, go check it out. So I'm like, well, I know I have a missions heart. I know God's called me pretty confidently to East Africa. So I said, you know what, Holly, this would be a great trip for you to come on. Um, we had senior missionaries are going with us over this on this trip at the time. So we're like, so I invited Holly to come along. And everything that we thought was going to happen in Kenya didn't happen. In fact, we were blocked from doing anything. So we're in Tanzania. And one evening, as two newlyweds were, we separated ourselves from everyone else, and we were on this back porch, standing in front of, uh, they called it a house, but most recently it was housing goats and chickens. And, and we're on this porch, and we're looking out, and down below there's a beautiful view of Lake Diluti in Arusha, Tanzania. And while we're standing there looking in each other's eyes and looking at the view, Holly just looks up at me and says, I think this is where God is calling us. And I'm like, wow, God just told me the exact same thing. Confirmation. Now, in our thinking, well, if God's called us, man, things are going to start moving quickly. We, we come home, we're, we're married. I didn't say this in the first service, so we'll make it clear. We're married seven months later, all right? We're still in California, all right? Uh, two years after that, Clayton comes along. We're still in California. Another year after Clayton comes along, Remington pops in. We're still in California. Two years after that, Carson is born. And during this time, we began to wonder, God, did we hear from you? God, was that you? God, have we done something wrong? And it was seven years from God saying, this is where I'm calling you, to where the leadership of the church came and said, Chris, have you ever considered, have you and Holly ever considered being missionaries to Tanzania? We want you to pray about it and get back to us. And I'm like, we don't have to pray. God spoke it eight years ago. But I'll confirm that Holly hasn't changed her mind. I know I haven't. You know, and then the door began to open. And you know, the life-changing event, we began to walk out in it. And once we got to Tanzania, within two months, we realized if we had come earlier, we weren't ready for Tanzania. And Tanzania wasn't ready for us. God's timing was perfect. What he wanted us to do, somebody else had to lay the foundation for and we, that wasn't what we were called to do. We were called to take it to another level. So, you know, that's one of the ways Holy Spirit guides, that Holy Spirit directs us. And many of us here, if I went around the room, I am confident you can share similar situations and similar stories. But it's his job to point us in the right direction. And when we listen and when we surrender to him, he is faithful to do that. The next thing Holy Spirit does is he provides comfort, right? It's his job to provide comfort. He's referred to as the comforter. Um, now, in your bulletin and in the notes, I believe it says John 9.31. That was my fault. Cross it out and write Acts. Acts 9.31, please. Acts 9.31 says, So the church throughout all Judea and Galilee and Samaria had peace and was being built up and walking in the fear of the Lord and in the comfort of the Holy Spirit, it multiplied. When the Holy Spirit is comforting, growth happens. When, when we allow the comforter to do his job, we grow. Uh, and we've already read John 14, 16 that said, and I will ask the Father and he will give you another helper to be with you forever. Um, Jesus promised to send Holy Spirit, that the, the word for helper is translated different ways. King James calls him comforter. The NIV calls him advocate. Uh, the English Standard Version, which is what I'm using today, calls him our helper. The Greek word is parakletos, and it means one who is called to our side. One who stands beside us. He's with us to comfort us. 
When we receive Jesus Christ as our Lord and Savior, God dispatches his Holy Spirit to reside in us, always ready to assist, always ready to console, to reassure, and guide us in times of distress or need. That's his job. Now, when you have a stressful day, We all have them from time to time. Maybe it's stressful because it was a loss of a loved one. Maybe it's stressful because you've been just going full on all day long. We all have our comfort routines, and they might all look different. For some, it might be, don't talk to me. Give me something cold or something hot to drink. Let me put my feet up and decompress. That's our comfort routine. For others, it's like, oh, on the way home, I'm buying ice cream. You know, it, 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 it might be just, I just want to get in my bed with my covers on, close my eyes, and forget the day. But what happens is our way of coping with the stress is a way that we recharge. It's a way that we're able to continue. Well, Holy Spirit is our comforter. He helps us to relax. He gives us the strength and the energy to continue in um, difficult situations. Jesus refers to Holy Spirit as our comforter. How amazing is it to think that no matter what we go through, the most powerful source of comfort we could ever want is always available to us. The the Webster's Dictionary defines comfort as to give strength and hope, to cheer, to ease the grief or trouble of, or to console. Whether we need encouragement, strength, or consoling, or hope, it's always there for us through the Holy Spirit. Now, I remember, I haven't seen too much in my lifetime, but several, I've watched all the televised events around a presidential funeral. And when you're watching the presidential funeral, you will always see that if his, if his spouse has survived him, you will always see her standing there, and there's a soldier at her side. Quite often, her arms might be draped within his, and it's the job of this soldier to guide and direct her and provide her comfort during this time. He lets her know all of the pomp and circumstance that's expected of her. Oh, now you you need to sit down. Now you need to stand up. Now we need to go over here. Um, And he's just there as a comfort and someone to provide uh, direction to. Well, God says you don't have to be a president to have that available to you, and you don't have to wait till you die. Holy Spirit is available today to come alongside you and help you with whatever you face. That's what it means to be a comforter, a helper, or an advocate. It's important that we remember wherever you go, wherever you do, God himself will be with you through Holy Spirit. This is the most comforting thought I can think of. No matter what place I find myself in, And I've found myself in some stressful places, sometimes because of my own stupidity, the other because it's where God wanted me to be. When I would turn to Holy Spirit, he was always there. He was always there to provide not just the direction, what I need to do, but to provide me the encouragement to continue to do what I need to do. The Holy Spirit helps control any thought that is counter to the word of God. So what happens when we start getting thoughts that don't line up with the Word of God, thoughts that cause us to doubt, thoughts that might depress us, thoughts that might hinder us, we call on Holy Spirit to help show us what we need to do, what we should do. Uh, And when we do that, we do not have to allow the circumstances that we face to dictate our feelings or emotions. God's Word, God's promise, it was what should dictate them. The comfort we receive in our spirits can flow to our minds and invite Holy Spirit in to our life to lead us, guide us, direct us, and comfort us. See, when we follow the Holy Spirit, we are receiving a promise that God made to us. And we choose how much of that promise we want to receive. When, when we receive the Holy Spirit, we have our God's GPS, God's global positioning system. Pastor Bobby preached a message on that a few years ago. There to guide us, lead us, and direct us. And we have our helper, our advocate, our comforter, who is there always to help us in our time of need. But that's not all we have. We also have Holy Spirit. And when Holy Spirit comes, he brings power. And that is that power that he brings that enables us to transform the world.
We've already read Acts 1.8. When you receive power, you will receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you. Why do we receive this power? Do we receive this power so people look and say, wow, that person's really great, or that person must have a great relationship with God, or, or wow, I need to go to that church. No, he's told us the reason we receive the power is so that we can be witnesses of his love to the world. Every time a miracle is performed, it's to be a witness. God loves you. God loves the world. And that's what makes a difference. I have an evangelist friend in South Africa, and he's in a heavy Muslim area. And he says, when I go into an area and I want to start a campaign, I ask God to bring a Muslim to me that needs to be healed. And he goes, and when that Muslim is healed, within a few weeks, the entire family is in the church because they can't argue with the power of God. They can't argue with the love of God. And, and trust me, before the Muslim comes to a Christian church, he's tried everything. Yeah. He's done everything he can do. He's gone to all the doctors. He's taken all of the, their recommended medi uh, medications and all the herbal things that he could possibly take. He's done his prayers. He, he's given up his things and still no change, but he comes into the church and he sees God's love poured out on his son or daughter or his father or his mother, and suddenly the whole family is there because you can't argue with God's love. And the miracles and the miraculous is an extension of God's love. God never calls us and sends us to go alone because the Holy Spirit is there to lead and guide us. When he's leading and guiding us, he's comforting us. And as he's comforting us, he's also giving us the power to do what God has called us to do. The, the word power is dunamis. And it literally means the power to do the miraculous. And it's tied to the person who is giving you that power. We can do the miraculous because God has the power over everything. And he enables us to do it. It's also where, they get, where we get the word dynamite from. And you know, dynamite is explosive. Dynamite makes a difference. When used properly, it can make light work of something that could take a long time to do. But no matter how it's used, dynamite always makes an impact. And you know what? God is calling us to make an impact. He's calling us to make a difference. You don't wonder if dynamite was used. You can see it. You can see the evidence of it. And God's calling the church to walk in the power of the evidence of what's taking place. The Holy Spirit did, not, did indeed come on the day of Pentecost, and none of those people in that room were ever the same again after they were empowered by a Holy Spirit for life and ministry. The lives of the 120 men and women that were in that room today, these men walked with Jesus. They touched Jesus. They ate with Jesus. They heard the teachings of Jesus, and then they got the after teachings that most people weren't privy to. They were equipped, they had the information, but it was when Holy Spirit came upon them that they had the power to do something about it. They had the power to go out and make a difference. I might step on some toes today, but that's okay. I have size 13 shoes, I'm used to stepping on toes. Okay? Too often, people place too much, too much emphasis on certain parts of Holy Spirit, i.e. speaking in tongues. I believe, I believe in speaking in tongues and its purpose and place in our life. But how much does the book of Acts talk about speaking in tongues and how much does it talk about miracles? How much does it talk about displaying God's love? In fact, if you ask Dr. Google about miracles in the book of Acts, he can't give you an answer. Well, he'll give you a bunch of them, actually. Because you can't record them all. Because sometimes the miracle is everywhere Peter's shadow when everyone was healed. Well, how many people did the shadow cross over? I don't know. They don't tell us those details. All right? But the book of Acts records twice as many miracles as all the Gospels. Why? Because it was about Holy Spirit coming. It was about the dunamis power. It was about the release of God on the world in a way that the world had never came. It was about men and women that decided to step up to the next level and live the life that God had called them to live. And that promise wasn't limited to the book of Acts era. 
All right? You know, sometimes I've heard people say, oh, wow, I wish I was in when Africa because I hear the stories of people being raised from the dead. And I'm like, you know, that can happen here. But we have to be open and believe that God not only wants to do it, he wants to do it through you and I. I, I have a pastor friend in, in Kenya, and a member of his congregation passed away. And she was going to go visit the family, and his wife goes with her, and they're visiting the family, and his, his wife tugs on his shoulder and says, I think God wants to raise her from the dead. And he's like, well, then you pray for her. Because <laughs> God didn't show me that. She prayed for her, and she rose up from the dead. They were coming to do funeral processions, and she's out there praising God and giving glory to God. But see... God revealed, and someone believed. That's what God wanted to do. And God's love was poured out on that village in a major, major way. Do we believe that's what God wants to do with us today? Do we believe that that's what God wants to do in our families, in our communities, in our workplace? Maybe we've been believing for the impossible, and we're beginning to wonder, God, why? Well, I believe Holy Spirit wants to take us today and he wants to move us from that window of why and carry us to the doorway of the miraculous power of God. But in order for that to happen, we have to be open to Holy Spirit's comfort. We have to be open to the Holy Spirit to come and do his part in our life. We've heard how the Holy Spirit is a promise. A promise that's made available to us and will be with us always He's a gift that we choose to either reject, limit, or accept fully. How much are we open in accepting the gift of Holy Spirit today? We've learned that the Holy Spirit points us in the right direction. When we read the Bible, he helps us to understand and apply it in our life. When we are not sure what to do in a new situation, Holy Spirit will confirm and point us in the right direction. When we're tired, when we're depressed, when, when, when we don't know what to do, Holy Spirit is our comforter. He comes and stands alongside us, taps us on the shoulder and says, I got this. This is what you need to do. But he doesn't stop there. He's the one that says, I've got this, and this is what we're going to do, and we're going to see God do amazing things when everyone else said no. Because he provides us with the power to do great miracles as a demonstration of God's love for the world. Perhaps today you find yourself needing one of these benefits of the Holy Spirit in our life. Maybe you found that you never totally understood what it meant to surrender completely to Holy Spirit. And that we have some responsibility to prepare and position ourselves to be filled because the filling doesn't happen once. It's continually. Because God expects us to go out and sprinkle some of that Holy Spirit on other people and then we need to come back and we need to be filled again. So next we want to look at what we can do to create an environment of total surrender to Holy Spirit. Our last point this this morning is promoting an environment for being filled with the Holy Spirit. What actions can we take? And and really, I just, I went to the book of Acts chapter 1 and 2. What happened on the day of Pentecost? What did they do to prepare themselves? So the first thing that we see is you have to believe in the promise, right? You have to believe that Holy Spirit is not only for today, but he's for you today. And God wants to fill you completely overflowing with Holy Spirit. Acts chapter 1, verses 4 and 5, Jesus is speaking. And while staying with them, he ordered them not to depart from Jerusalem, but to wait for the promise of the Father, which he said, You heard from me, for John baptized with water, but you will be baptized with the Holy Spirit not many days from now. They believed. And they went to the upper room. We have to believe in the promise and the power of the Holy Spirit today if we expect to move to next level living. The second thing we have to do is we have to wait with preparation or we have to prepare while we're waiting. We don't just sit there and wait with our fingers crossed and our legs crossed drinking 
Thai, uh, drinking tea or coffee. No, we have to make sure that we prepare. Um, Acts chapter 1 and 14 says, All these were with one accord, were devoting themselves to prayer together with the women and Mary, the mother of Jesus, and his brothers. 120 in the upper room, waiting together. Now, Jesus never, we don't see him commanding them to wait together, but they were waiting together. And I believe part of that is, is because they believed there was safety in numbers because they hadn't received Holy Spirit yet. They hadn't received the boldness that comes with Holy Spirit. But they waited, all right? They didn't wait one day. They didn't wait two days, not three, four, or five days. Ten days they waited. How many times did someone in that group start saying, hmm, I wonder if we were supposed to go and do something else. I wonder if we should, you know, I'm going to go out and do some things. Text me if something happens. You know, make sure you update your Instagram so I know that I need to come because something's taking place right then and there. No, they waited. But while they were waiting, they were in praying and they were seeking God. All right? Also, while they were waiting, they took care of some business that, that we see in those things. But while we're waiting, we need to prepare. Because when God moves, we need to be ready to move. All right? So we believe in the promise. We wait with preparation. Number three, we obey his proclamations. We do what he tells us to do. All right? What did Jesus tell them to do? He told them to wait, not to leave Jerusalem. In Acts chapter 2 and verse 1, we read, When the day of Pentecost arrived, they were all together in one place. What was their instruction? Wait. What did they do? They waited. We have to obey. If we want God to move in our lives, we have to do what he tells us to do. Sometimes Holy Spirit reveals something to us, but maybe we don't have the complete faith, so we miss out. We could be like Pastor Lawrence when his wife said, I, I, I believe God wants to raise this person from the dead. And he's like, you do it, because <laughs> I'm not willing to put myself in that place. You know, but if we want to see the power of Holy Spirit at work around us, we have to be willing to obey and do what he tells us to do. Number four, we have to receive without prejudice, all right? Holy Spirit comes different ways. We have to be willing to receive him however he comes. Um, Acts chapter 2, verses 2 through 4, and suddenly there came from heaven a sound like a mighty rushing wind, and it filled the entire house where they were sitting. And divided tongues as of fire appeared to them and rested on each of them. And they were all filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak in other tongues as the Spirit gave them utterance. All right? Holy Spirit, when he came on the day of Pentecost, there was no question he was there. All right? There was a wind that filled the room. There was, it was like fire resting on people's heads. They knew what, that this is what God promised them would come. And they received the promise without trying to figure it out and judge it. Well, was the Holy Spirit the wind or was he the fire? How do I know I have the Holy Spirit? Wait, what did you say? I don't understand you. No, you're not making any sense, Peter. Speak English. No, see, you have to receive him however he comes and be ready to do what happens next. And the last point is we have to walk in his power. It's not enough to believe. It's not enough to receive. We have to walk it out in everyday life. Uh, Acts chapter 2, verses 40 and 41, it says, And with many other words he bore witness and continued to exhort them, saying... Now, this is Peter talking. This is the man who, 50 days ago, when he was asked if he knew Christ, <laughs> me? Not, not, not me, I've never seen the man before. Who is that anyways? Jesus, no, that's not Jesus. Now, 50 days later, he's saying, man, I mean, his message is, is inspiring and it's powerful. He tells him, you know, the man you crucified, yeah, that one that you nailed to the cross, he rose from the dead. And you hardened your heart, but he's still offering you a chance to make a difference. See, that's the message of Peter. And then it says, he says to them, save yourself from this crooked generation. So those who received his word were baptized, and they were added that day about 3,000 souls. And that was one day. 
You read in a few verses later, 5,000. You read 2,000. Things were happening. Why? Because these men gave up their wants. These men gave up their, their desires. These men surrendered themselves and said, God, I want more of you. I want your Holy Spirit in my life. And I'm willing to believe that you want to do everything that was promised to do. I'm willing to wait and be prepared for you to come. I'm willing to obey whatever you tell me to do. I'm willing to receive it without judging how it comes without having to understand how you're going to do it, without prejudice, God, I'm ready to act, and I'm ready to walk in your power. That's the type of individual that experiences next-level living. And you begin to think about it. These men ushered in an era that continues to affect people today. I mean, Holy Spirit essentially introduced multi-level marketing. And it's been successful for thousands of years. You share with other people. They share with other people. They all enjoy the benefits of the kingdom. Why? Because the Holy Spirit power works. And it doesn't matter your age. Holy Spirit can guide and direct you no matter what. Larry and Beverly were giving me a testimony this morning. Larry's mother is transitioning. And two weeks ago, she would have been transitioning to hell. All right, trust me, Larry and Beverly and other family members shared the gospel. But at 91, she wasn't ready to hear it. Even from somebody she could witness in herself. But a chaplain comes to visit her and looks her in the eye and says, do you want to go to heaven? And she says, yes, I want to go to heaven. And he goes, this is what you need to do. And see, and in that simple act, Holy Spirit prepared her heart Holy Spirit guided and directed the chaplain. And Holy Spirit provided comfort to Beverly and Larry, knowing now when mom transitions, she's in heaven for eternity. I will see her again. <laughs> Trust me, ask Larry, it's a miracle. A heart surrendered to God. That's what happens when we walk in his power. Let's stand this morning, please. So I want to ask you again the, the question that I, I started with. Are you satisfied with the level of Holy Spirit in your life? Or do you want to be the person that walks in a room and the difference is made? Do you want to be the catalyst for impact for what God wants to do in your family? Do you want to be the catalyst for impact, what God wants to do in the nation or even in the country or to another place that God sends you? It's the Holy Spirit that gives us the power to go to this next level. So if you're here this morning and you're like, man, that, that sounds really good, Chris. That sounds really awesome. I think, you know, that would be really good for this person. Put the finger back at your heart and say, God, are you speaking to me? Are you, are you ready to admit, I need more Holy Spirit in my life? Because I want to invite the, the, those that are on um, prayer ministry today to come forward. And if, if you just want prayer, and it can be prayer for Holy Spirit, it can be prayer for healing, it can be prayer for anything. When I close the service, you're welcome to come up. And, and these people would like to pray for you. I also want to say as I'm closing, we have some of these books back at the information desk if you would like one. And it's called, How Can I Be Filled with Holy Spirit by Larry Kreider. So they're available at the desk. They're free. Uh, we have a limited number available. But if you would like one, please uh, pick one up if you want to hear more about Holy Spirit. But if Holy Spirit is prompting you, if Holy Spirit is leading you, I even want to say if you've been hitting a wall on a breakthrough. Okay? You know, Carol's testimony this morning with, with the neck and the shoulder pain and it was nagging and in the middle of worship her breakthrough came why? because Holy Spirit's here so if, if you've been struggling with a breakthrough and you're beginning to wonder when Lord seems like it's been a long time know that God's timing is right and, and they will pray with you for your breakthrough today um, so uh, we just we want to we want to just surrender. Holy Spirit, we come and we surrender to you today. 
Holy Spirit, we come and we ask you to be our, our comforter, to lead and to guide us. Holy Spirit, if you're speaking to individuals today, allow Holy Spirit to confirm within them that yes, they can come forward, Father. Holy Spirit, help us to believe in, the, in your promise, but not just your promise, but in your power, Lord. That, that you're just as strong and powerful today as you were on the day of Pentecost. And give us the faith to walk in the power of miraculous living so we can experience the next level that you have for us, Father. We thank you, Father.